9. The USS Wasp World War II-era aircraft carrier USS Wasp was found in the Coral Sea by the late Paul Allen study team. The wreckage was discovered over 14,000 feet below the sea's surface by the crew members on board the RV Petrel. The Petrel and its crew members rely on an autonomous underwater vehicle, or AUV, that propels and drives itself. This gadget can dive up to 18,000 feet on a pre-programmed path before automatically emerging to the surface. When the vehicle is craned back on board, crew members gather information from it that researchers can swiftly evaluate. The aircraft was discovered by the Petrel crew during its sixth AUV run in search of the WASP. On September 15, 1942, the USS WASP, a US Navy aircraft carrier, was hit by two or possibly three torpedoes from a Japanese submarine. The crippled ship was then abandoned, then torpedoed by an American destroyer to send it to the bottom, approximately 14,000 feet below, 350 miles southeast of Guadalcanal. The USS Wasp was part of a convoy delivering reinforcements to the island during the Marine Corps' fierce battle for Guadalcanal. While the Wasp was in transit, the Japanese submarine I-19 fired several torpedoes at the aircraft carrier. Navy officials are unsure if two or three of those torpedoes hit the Wasp. Other torpedoes in that bombardment also hit the destroyer USS O'Brien and the battleship USS North Carolina that was close by. Torpedoes had explosive warheads that ignited when they made contact with their target and moved just beneath the surface. When the Wasp was attacked, multiple explosions rocked the ship and caused fires to start from the inside. US Navy officials were forced to scuttle the Wasp by firing torpedoes at it because it was going to sink on its own in a matter of hours. 8. Heaven Can Wait In 2021, a B-24 bomber Heaven Can Wait was discovered in the Chinese seas near Hansa Bay off Papua New Guinea. Project Recover, a group of marine scientists, archaeologists, and volunteers working together to identify planes related to World War II missing in action were the ones to find it. Heaven Can Wait crew members were on a mission to the Hansa Bay region in 1944 to attack Japanese anti-aircraft guns when their B-24 was fired at, sending it crashing down into the water. It's one of the five US planes that crashed into the bay. Relatives of one of the Heaven Can Wait crew members accumulated years of study on the circumstances of the disaster and gave it to Project Recover. It includes mission documentation, military reports, and crew journal entries. After obtaining research, a team at Project Recover prioritized discovering Heaven Can Wait. An archaeological study of Hansa Bay was conducted in October 2017, and based on historical records, Heaven Can Wait was located offshore near the north end of the bay. They spent 11 long days on the ocean, searching 10 miles of seabed, utilizing high-definition images, scanning sonars, and underwater robotic technology. After a long search, Project Recover discovered the B-24 bomber Heaven Can Wait 213 feet below the surface. Today, over 72,000 World War II troops remain unaccounted for, but Project Recover intends to continue its task. 7. Missing Remains Former Japanese Prime Minister Hideki Tonjo was convicted of war crimes and sentenced to death for his role in planning the Pearl Harbor attack in 1948. He and six others were executed by hanging. American officials handled the remains, keeping their location hidden to prevent ultra-nationalists from glorifying the executed men as martyrs. Nihon University professor Hiroki Takazawa announced that he had discovered the answer to this long-lasting riddle through declassified U.S. military documents he examined at the U.S. National Archives in Washington, D.C. Takazawa spent several years going over the documents before making his findings public. Based on the evidence, he believes Tojo's ashes were dispersed by a U.S. military plane over the Pacific Ocean, approximately 30 miles away. Official documents have revealed details about his final resting place for the first time. Tojo's great-grandson Hidetoshi expressed relief at the news, saying that not knowing the location of the remains had been hurtful and humiliating for the family. 6. Letter Disclosing Anne Frank's Location A cold case study identified a fellow Jewish man as a key suspect in the betrayal of diarist Anne Frank and her family potentially bringing an end to one of World War II's most long-lasting mysteries. According to a six-year inquiry directed by a former FBI agent, Arnold van den Berg may have offered the Nazis access to the Frank secret hideout in Amsterdam 
in an attempt to protect his own family. There are numerous theories about the Nazi raid on August 4, 1944 that exposed the secret annex to an Amsterdam house where Anne and her family had been hiding. After the Nazis conquered the Netherlands and began targeting Jewish people, Anne and her family sought refuge in the annex. On her 13th birthday, she got a journal and wrote in it frequently while staying hidden, but it was eventually seized and she and her family were transported to a concentration camp. Sadly, Anne and her sister died in 1945, but her journal contained horrifying tales of what she and many others went through during the Holocaust. In 2016, Veteran FBI detective Vince Pankoke was recruited to lead a team to investigate the cold case that two previous police investigations had failed to solve. Despite getting no notice, Berg's name went to the top of Pankoke's list following his exhaustive investigation. It was revealed that Berg organized the Jewish Council, which transported Jewish individuals from Netherlands to extermination camps. Berg's family was exempt from transport according to investigators. It was later revoked precisely at the same time the Franks were taken from the secret annex. Anne's father, the sole survivor of the extermination camps, told investigators in 1964 that he received a letter soon after the war naming Van der Berg as the betrayer of his family and many others. The crew located a copy of Otto Frank's letters in the files of a police officer. According to Ronald Leopold, executive director of the Anne Frank House, the investigation produced significant new material. However, he stated that doubts remained. Have you read Anne Frank's diary? Let us know in the comments and hit subscribe while you're at it. 5. The USS Greyback During World War II, a total of 52 US submarines were reported missing. Thanks to the Lost 52 project, six of them have already been found, and in 2019 the organization made the seventh discovery of the long-lost submarine, the USS Greyback. The USS Greyback was found 1,427 feet underwater off the coast of Okinawa and was the first American submarine to be found in Japanese waters. A document error was revealed in the longitudinal estimation for where it sank, which helped the Lost 52 calculate the right location. They were able to locate the submarine, with newly discovered Japanese mission logs and advanced technology roughly 100 miles from where it was documented in historical records. On its ninth combat patrol in December 1943, the Greyback utilized all of its torpedoes to sink four cargo ships weighing more than 10,000 tons. Throughout the war, the USS Greyback sank 14 ships and caused chaos for many others. At the end of its career, it vanished during its last mission in 1944 while it was on its way to the East China Sea. Just a month after leaving for a patrol mission, the servicemen stressed that the submarine only had two torpedoes left. The USS Greyback was directed to go home, but it didn't take long for everyone to find out it was destroyed by the enemy. The Greyback was scheduled to arrive in Midway on March 7, 1944, but never arrived. On March 30, 1944, it was reported as lost. 4. Missing Treasure The discovery of a German World War II shipwreck made headlines due to its potential to solve an old enigma surrounding stolen treasure. The location of a collection of valuables taken by the Nazis from the Amber Room, a gilded chamber that was once a fixture of a Tsarist palace, is one of the war's most famous mysteries. The trove was last spotted in Kaliningrad, a modern-day Russian enclave that was a Baltic port city known as Königsberg during World War II. It left the port on the Karlsruhe steamer, which was sunk off the Polish coast by Soviet aircraft in 1945. The ship, loaded with heavy cargo and 1,083 passengers, had left in a hurry as part of a massive sea voyage. The Karlsruhe had been taking part in Operation Hannibal, which was a mass evacuation that relocated over a million German troops and civilians as the Soviets advanced into East Prussia towards the end of the war. Polish divers claimed to have discovered the wreck. According to diver Tomasz Danczura, it contains military vehicles, porcelain, and crates with unknown contents. It remains to be seen whether these crates contain the missing Amber Room treasures, but the possibility of finally uncovering the vanished collection is alluring on its own. 3. Chief Gestapo Heinrich Müller The Chief Gestapo and most senior Nazi Heinrich Müller's fate was unknown until 2013. It was determined he died in Berlin in 1945 and was buried in a Jewish cemetery. He was last seen one day after Adolf Hitler's suicide in Berlin in 1945. 
But according to British investigators, there was zero evidence that the senior Nazi died in the fall of Berlin or ran to South America. His pilot quoted Müller as saying, I haven't the faintest intention of being taken prisoner by the Russians. After that, he disappeared without a trace. A professor named Johannes Tuchel has discovered proof that suggests Müller did die in Berlin in 1945 and was buried in a provisional grave in a garden at the Luftwaffe headquarters, which was later moved to a mass grave in a Jewish cemetery. According to the professor, any mystery surrounding Müller has been solved. He was decorated in World War I and was a policeman before Reinhard Heydrich, an architect of the Holocaust, recruited him to the SS and the Gestapo. Müller reported to Heydrich until his assassination in Prague in 1942. Afterward, he reported to Heinrich Himmler, head of the paramilitary SS. Müller was remembered as a bureaucrat who was committed to the Holocaust and was also in charge of many of the mass executions of Soviet POWs. Tuchel was investigating a massacre that had been ordered by Müller when he stumbled across documents with information on the demise of Müller. He then obtained information from a gravedigger who'd previously worked for the communist government of what was then East Germany. This individual recalled burying a man in 1945 in the Berlin Mieter Jewish Cemetery who was dressed in a general's uniform. The military decorations found on the body trace by Professor Tuchel were archived back to Berlin and then checked with data from German intelligence and the US Central Intelligence Agency. It was confirmed that Müller was dead and Tuchel traced Müller's corpse to a Jewish cemetery that dated back to the 17th century. The location of the Jewish cemetery had been destroyed by the Nazis, which ended up becoming a gravesite for more than 2,700 people who were killed in airstrikes and the fall of Berlin. It now serves as a Jewish memorial. A Nazi general buried in a Jewish cemetery is ironic, but due to the Jewish religious law, exhumations are forbidden. 2. Andrew Ladner the remains of a soldier killed during World War II have now been returned to Mississippi for burial after nearly 80 years. Private Andrew J. Ladner's identity was confirmed on 9th July 2021, as was reported by the Defense POW slash MIA Accounting Agency, DPAA. Ladner deployed to the 126th Infantry Regiment in the fall of 1942, and he was killed on November 30, 1942, while he and his unit were cutting off the Japanese supply as well as the communications line coming from their beachhead at San Ananda village, situated on the island of New Guinea. The unit's roadblock, known as the Huggins Roadblock, was successful, but Ladner was killed in the initial attack. Following the war, he was buried 78 feet west of the road his unit was blockading. However, Ladner's remains were recovered in April 1943 and buried in a temporary U.S. cemetery in the nearby village of Saputa. In 1949, the unidentified bones were transferred to the Philippines and buried in a separate cemetery. In 1995, organizations dedicated to identifying POW slash MIA servicemen from World War II launched a new effort to locate people from the battle in which Ladner went missing. In November 2016, the exhumation of Ladner's remains, which were only recognized by the number X1545, was prompted by an investigation of previously unknown casualty data. Andrew was finally returned home to his family earlier this spring, where he received a proper burial. His name is on the walls of the missing in the Manila American Cemetery. A rosette was placed next to his name to reflect that he was discovered. 1. Mystery World War II Photo A happy family is captured in a photograph standing amidst the ruins during the horrifying attack on Warsaw in 1944. It was published all over the media after the Institute of National Remembrance was given the collection of Henry Migatz, which included the image of a mother and father holding an infant that appeared to be only a few days old. It soon caught the attention of Stefan Piotrowski, the woman's brother. He later revealed that the woman in the photo was his sister, Barbara Piotrowska, her husband, and their infant daughter, Jadwiga. He added that the photograph was taken a few days after the baby was born. She had returned to Warsaw from working as a slave laborer in the Reich after being detained and deported by German authorities when she was 16 years old, and she was hiding under a different name when the baby was born. Post-uprising, Barbara, her husband, and her daughter were taken from Warsaw and brought to the Pruskow transit camp, along with the rest of the city's residents. She was soon sent to Germany, where she worked as a forced laborer. 
She was then able to flee near Chetstawa and rejoin her family in Milanovic. The Germans were adamant. They refused to leave her alone, and Stefan remembered the German military raiding their home once more. This time, a German soldier ordered them to flee and save themselves. Everyone in the house was able to escape. She was able to live a somewhat peaceful life after that, before developing rheumatism and passing away at the age of 78. Her daughter passed away 10 years ago. Number 10. Austrian Treasure an Austrian man found around 200 pieces of jewelry in his backyard in Wiener Neustadt, south of Vienna. He was digging to enlarge a pond in his garden when he came across hundreds of these pieces that were caked with mud. He put them in a box in his basement and forgot about them for a few years. When he came across them again while packing up his belongings after selling his house, some of the mud had dried up and fallen off, revealing precious metals and gems. He cleaned them up better with regular household cleaners and posted pictures of the jewels on the internet. Experts informed him that they could be quite old and worth a lot of money. An amateur archaeologist asked him to report the find to the Austrian Federal Monument Agency, BDA, so he packed them up and took them there. Austria's department in charge of national antiquities said the find comprises over 200 rings, brooches, ornate belt buckles, gold-plated silver plates, and other pieces, many covered with pearls, fossilized coral, and other decorations. Experts at the agency say the objects are around 650 years old and are being assessed for their background and value. While they've not yet placed a monetary value on the buried treasure, the exciting language from the usually stoic Federal Office for Memorials revealed the importance that is connected to the discovery. Fairy tales still exist, they said in their statement. Private individual finds a sensational treasure in his garden. It described the ornaments as one of the qualitatively most significant discoveries of medieval treasure in Austria. The monetary value will only be gauged after all the research on where they originated and what materials they're made of have been done. Although many experts agree their value could very well at least be six figures. The man who found them, who wishes to remain anonymous, has no intention of selling the treasure. He wishes to make this lovely and historical prize available to the public. Many of the jewels will be accessible to the public in Vienna's Hofburg Palace complex, the official dwelling of the President of Austria, the seat of government, and a museum displaying Imperial Habsburg history. Number 9. Ferrari Dino 264 GTS According to one famous urban legend, a group of kids were digging in the mud outside of a Los Angeles home in 1978 when they struck what looked and felt like the roof of an old car. They flagged down a sheriff's deputy and a crew soon arrived at the scene where they dug up a metallic green Dino 264 GTS Ferrari. The discovery made the front page of the Los Angeles Times, which reported that the car was in amazingly good condition. Other than a hole over the right taillight, there appeared to be no visible damage. Photos from the scene have circulated for decades as the case continues to fascinate people. The car's owner, Rosindo Cruz, reported that it was stolen four years earlier in 1974, but the case went cold from there as law enforcement struggled to figure out how and why it ended up buried in someone's yard. In 2012, Jalopnik writer Mike Spinelli contacted Dennis Carroll, one of the original detectives that worked the case. Carroll told Spinelli that an informant had tipped off investigators about the buried car. Detectives concocted the story about a group of unsuspecting children discovering the vehicles as a way of concealing the informant's identity. The car wasn't stolen after all. The tipster told law enforcement that Cruz had hired some co-conspirators to stage the crime so he could collect on the insurance. But police could not prove these claims and Cruz was never charged with any crimes. The Ferrari was given to the insurance company that handled the original theft claim and it was soon discovered that the car was in worse shape than it had seemed at first. In fact, its condition was disastrous. The body was rusted out and the damage had spread to the leather seats because whoever buried the car forgot to roll up the windows first. A young mechanic bought the Ferrari at an auction and restored it to perfect condition. Nobody knows what happened to it after that, but many believe that it's still out there somewhere, perhaps in the possession of a classic car enthusiast. Number 8. Record-Breaking Coin Hoard An amateur with a metal detector was treasure hunting outside his Norfolk, England home during the 1990s when he found an old coin. It was the first of many he would dig up over the next 30 years, ultimately amassing a collection of 131 pieces. Rivaling the size of the famed Sutton Hoo Hoard, which has more gold but fewer coins, it's the largest Anglo-Saxon coin hoard ever found. Most of the coins are Frankish tremises dating between 580 and 630 AD. The collection also consists of nine larger Roman coins called solidi, as well as some gold jewelry and pendants. The items have already taught experts some things they didn't previously know about the early 7th century trade in the region, including that coins from outside the area were initially used before currency started being minted locally. An expert is examining the artifacts to determine if they qualify as treasure under the Treasure Act. This designation would automatically hand ownership of the hoard over to the crown. 
to ensure that the items were kept off the black market and made available for the public to enjoy. Anything that's over 300 years old and made from over 10% precious metals usually falls into this category. Number 7. A Lost Sculpture In 2002, a weathered statue of a reclining woman sold for $7,540 at an auction in Sussex, England. Its new owners, a British couple who had bought the piece to decorate their yard with, soon began hearing rumors that they might have received recumbent Magdalena, a long-missing masterpiece by Italian sculptor Antonio Canova. The statue depicts Mary Magdalene in a state of grief. They hired an art advisor, and it was soon determined that the piece was, in fact, the original. Commissioned by then-British Prime Minister Lord Liverpool, the sculpture was started in 1819 and was finished in 1822, shortly before Canova's death. Over time, it fell into obscurity as it was passed through the hands of many owners, and it was lost until recently when it was identified as the recumbent Magdalena. The sculpture was restored to its original appearance and is slated to be auctioned off later this year for anywhere from $6,500,000 to $10,500,000. Number 6. Ferrari 166 Perchetta the Ferrari 166 Berchetta is widely considered the car that made the company. Only 25 of the 1952-liter V12 models were ever made. Ferrari had only been in business for three years. In 2007, a man named Manny De La Ros bought one of these extremely rare cars after it was found in the backyard of a home in Scottsdale, Arizona. Speaking with SF Gate, Monterey-based automotive historian Michael T. Lynch retold the tale of how the car ended up where it was found. During the 1950s, a man living in Europe found the abandoned 166M at a used car showroom in Lausanne, Switzerland. He called his friend Reg Lee Litton, a car enthusiast who lived in Scottsdale, and Litton told the man to buy the car for him. After paying somewhere between $5,000 and $8,000 for the vehicle, Litton's friend had it shipped to California. Litton picked the Ferrari up in Long Beach and drove it back to Scottsdale, where he raced against his friends who owned Maseratis and other sports cars. He drove it until something broke, and then he parked it in his backyard and covered it with some rugs and plastic. At some point, someone took the rugs for some other purpose, leaving the Ferrari exposed to the elements. It sat in Litton's yard until he died. His children sold the weathered car to De La Rose through a series of intermediaries for over $1 million. The buyer did some research and found out that the vehicle had run in historic races like Le Mans, Silverstone, and Targa Florio. A closer look during a mechanical rebuild revealed the date 6949 etched into the motor, which meant that it had been driven by former racing champion Juan Manuel Fangio. If you found a car like this, what would you do with it? Let me know in the comments and make sure to subscribe to the channel if you haven't yet. Number 5 rare Gold Rush era coins. What started out as an ordinary day for a Northern California couple in 2014 ended with the discovery of a fortune. They were taking their dog out for their regular walk when the wife spotted a rusty old can sticking out of the ground near an old tree. The pair dug up $10 million worth of rare gold coins in mint condition, many of which date back to the Gold Rush era. Altogether, the collection comprises 1,427 mostly uncirculated pristine coins in denominations of five, 10 and $20. They're dated between 1847 and 1894, and while their face value only amounted to around $27,000, some of them were so rare that experts placed their price tag as high as a million dollars. Gold is one of the few commodities that keep its value. To prevent a modern-day gold rush from coming to their yard and to avoid having to deal with fair-weather friends hoping to cash in on their newfound fortune, the couple who found the coins remained anonymous and kept their name out of the press. They held on to a few pieces as keepsakes but sold most of the coins and used the proceeds to pay their bills and quietly donate to charity. Number 4. The Serendipity Sapphire Workers were digging in a well in the backyard of a home in Sri Lanka when they discovered the world's largest sapphire cluster. Weighing roughly 2.5 million carats, the massive pale blue gem had an estimated value of around $100 million. Ironically, the property owner is a third-generation gem trader. Known only as Mr. Gamage, he told the BBC that one worker he had hired to dig as well alerted him to the discovery of some rare stones. Shortly thereafter, they found the gargantuan sapphire cluster. It took a year for experts to clear the cluster of impurities before they were able to thoroughly analyze it and certify it as authentic. Not all the stones are likely to receive as high a grading as the handful that fell out from the cluster during the analysis, but its sheer size makes it incredibly rare. Talak Virashing, the chairman of Sri Lanka's National Gem and Jewel Authority said that he believes the cluster will attract the attention of museums and private collectors, who will probably be willing to pay a pretty penny for it. Experts think the cluster formed around 400 million years ago. Even in the city of Ratnupra, which is famous for its valuable gem discoveries, it's incredibly unique. That it was discovered in a backyard by chance makes it even more fascinating and unusual. Number 3. Rare Drawing 
In 2016, a shopper bought a sketch featuring a mother and child for $30 at the estate sale of an architect in Massachusetts. The previous owner's father had been an art dealer and had given the drawing to his son before it ultimately landed in the buyer's hands. It featured the trademark signature of German Renaissance artist Albrecht Dürer, but neither the buyer nor the seller believed it was an authentic piece. The anonymous buyer told Artnet News that he purchased it because he liked it. Word of the drawing spread to Boston-based art collector Clifford Schurer, who learned of the artwork from a bookseller when he stopped to buy a book on his way to a party. The bookseller asked Schurer to look at the piece. He did, but he didn't hold his breath, since the last noteworthy Dürer drawing had been found over a century ago. Much to Schurer's surprise, it appeared to be the real deal. Speaking with CNN, he said that he told the owner the drawing was either a masterpiece or the greatest forgery he'd ever seen. Schurer spent the next three years verifying the artwork's authenticity, taking 17 international flights to various places throughout the world. Earlier this year, experts announced the drawing's estimated value at upwards of $10 million, and they've identified its title as The Virgin and Child. Number 2. Gold Coast Hoard Workers were clearing land in a backyard along Australia's Gold Coast in 2019 when they discovered wads of cash inside plastic containers wrapped in duct tape and newspaper. Police determined the bills had all been phased out of circulation back in 1996. Altogether, the banknotes totaled $476,630. Naturally, the money's discovery led to a legal battle over who it belonged to. The construction company that owned the property, the contractor whose employees found it, or the former property owner, Peter Chan. Mr. Chan claimed that his brother-in-law, traveling chef Stephen Ma, had shown him bundles of cash back in 1993 when he was staying at the home. He said that Ma had asked him to hold on to the money, which he wanted to keep out of the bank to avoid taxation, and that Chan had said no. Ma's son Raymond said that Stephen Ma had become strangely paranoid around that time. He said that he'd kept Chinese newspapers similar to the ones that some of the money was wrapped in when it was found. According to Raymond, Stephen grew increasingly worried about being followed, suggesting that he may have had something to hide, like a large amount of money. The current landowner, Morrison Construction Services, alleged that Ma either lacked the ability to make that amount of money or that he abandoned it on the property, surrendering any right to it by him or anyone associated with him. Meanwhile, the two tradesmen who discovered the cash claimed that the owner had hired them to remove it from the property, giving them legal rights to ownership of it. The judge ultimately ruled that Morrison Construction had the most rightful claim to the fortune because it was found on land that the company currently owns. But the fight continued and the parties involved eventually settled the dispute under confidential terms, leaving anyone who's followed the case to wonder who received what in terms of their share of the cash. Number 1. Rare Chinese Bowl a keen-eyed customer was at a yard sale outside a New Haven, Connecticut home in 2020 when a small porcelain bowl with a floral design caught his eye. He paid $35 for it and didn't haggle over the price. Something about the item compelled its new owner to suspect that it might be worth a lot more. The buyer consulted experts from Sotheby's Auction House, who identified the object as a rare 15th-century Chinese bowl dating back to the Yongle Emperor and the third Ming Dynasty ruler who ruled from 1403 to 1424. It was made for the Yongle court, which introduced a new artistic style to China. Only six other companion bowls existed, putting the artifact's estimated value at somewhere between $300,000 and $500,000. Angela McAteer, a Chinese art expert with Sotheby's, said that her team immediately recognized the quality of what she called an undisputed gem. She further pointed out that the piece is a reminder that precious works of art remain hidden in plain sight, just waiting to be found. Much to the surprise of everyone involved, including the bull's owner and its appraisers, it sold for $721,800 at auction to an anonymous buyer. It went for over $200,000 more than the experts predicted it would go for, and around 29,000 times what its previous owner paid for it. The ultimate price was determined after an intense bidding war between four prospective buyers. 9. Fukushima on a Friday afternoon in March 2011, the most powerful earthquake ever recorded in Japan struck off the country's eastern coast. The earthquake triggered a gigantic tsunami wave that cascaded over the defenses and flooded the reactors at the Fukushima power plant, causing what is known as Japan's triple disaster. Radiation leaked from the plant, forcing over 150,000 people to evacuate the area. It's become known as nothing more than an abandoned wasteland. It's a desolate, post-apocalyptic world that has rusting playgrounds and cars and motorcycles being ravished by overgrown vegetation. The cars appear to be in neat rows, looking like a graveyard. If you visit Fukushima today, you'll find stacks of televisions, fully stocked stores, an abandoned amusement park, 
and a perfectly set dinner table that appears to have been left behind right in the middle of dinner. It's completely empty, aside from the radioactive spiders and a few other animals. Residents and reconstruction workers who temporarily returned to Fukushima experienced massive health issues, such as infection from tetanus and animal bites, due to not being educated about the risks that come with Japan's native fauna and restoration activities. Before a safe return can be considered, the health issues having to do with wilderness overgrowth must be addressed. 8. Texola The arrival of Route 66 was very exciting as it brought hope and promise to many small towns in America. Since Route 66 is a major interstate highway, its construction resulted in bypassing these small towns, which resulted in their struggle and, eventually, their abandonment. Texola, Oklahoma, was no exception. It was a farm town before the arrival of Route 66, but once the tourists started flooding in, it became the cornerstone of the local economy. Even during its peak, Texola only had about 600 residents. But due to the Dust Bowl in the 1930s and Highway I-40 in the 1970s, the population of Texola plummeted to below 100 as its residents moved to other cities in hopes of building new and better lives. Alongside the handful of people, Texola holds one gas station, a one-cell jail with a lone truck parked out front, and a couple of creepy bars and empty restaurants. It has one operation restaurant known as the Tumbleweed Grill and Country Store, sitting alongside Route 66. It's not the only town that gives the apocalypse wasteland feelings, though. It's been said driving down Route 66 and passing through these seemingly abandoned towns is like driving through time. There's one town called Jericho Gap TX that's infamously known as the place where travelers got their car stuck in the mud. Locals love this because it brought business back to the dying area after its road was shut down and rerouted to Route 66. 7. Smallpox Hospital Roosevelt Island offers some of the most beautiful views of New York City, but it also holds a sinister secret from the past. Preserved on the small island are the remains of the Renwick Smallpox Hospital, a creepy castle-like structure. This now-abandoned institution first opened its doors to patients in 1986. The island was selected as a strategic location for this particular hospital because it acted as a natural quarantine, separating the numerous sick individuals who came through its doors from the rest of New York City's population. The smallpox hospital only had 100 beds, yet its mortality rate was 14,000 people by the time it closed. Given that the Renwick smallpox hospital was only open for 30 years, this is beyond disturbing. Given the time, the diseases that spread throughout the hospital happened deeply and quickly due to a lack of knowledge of the illnesses and how to treat them, and dealing with the aftermath of the deaths was anything but moral. The workers simply piled the bodies into a heap, burned them, and they were disposed of in the East River. Due to the graphic nature of the smallpox hospital, visitors believe paranormal activity looms throughout the structure, such as dark shadow figures and light anomalies lurking around the ruins. Some locals believe the spirits belong to past patients who have unfinished business or are confused about how to move on. Though the fragile structure is now abandoned, it can still be safely accessed by skylift or tram and can be viewed from a safe distance. 6. Home of Truth Home of Truth was built in 1933 in southeast Utah as a religious colony for a post-apocalyptic world. Marie Ogden, a wealthy widow, believed that the world was ending. She thought everywhere and everything would perish except for a plot of land within Dry Valley, Utah. It was there she believed Christ was going to have his second coming. When the commune first started, it had 22 members, but eventually grew to 100 members. Ogden was a self-proclaimed spiritualist, and she performed medium readings on her typewriter. She called this technique automatic writing and was convinced that she could communicate with angels and spirits. Residents were required to follow a strict code of conduct. They were told they had to turn in all their personal belongings in exchange for clothing, shelter, and food. They were also given a no alcohol or tobacco rule. Their main industries were farming and prospecting for gold on a small scale, but they didn't have much luck. The commune had a very basic and simple living principle, so living without indoor plumbing or electricity was no problem for them. On February 11, 1935, resident Edith Peshak passed away from cancer. Edith and her husband joined the commune in hopes of curing her disease through spirituality. According to Ogden, Peshak was in a state of purification, and she was going to come back to life. She and the rest of the residents fed and washed the body three times a day in a salt solution. Rumors spread throughout the town, causing an investigation by the sheriff and a visit to the commune in June 1935. Turns out that keeping a well-preserved body wasn't considered a health threat, and the Home of Truth was allowed to do so. 
Things remained quiet over the next few years until another investigation went underway in February 1937, when Ogden announced that Peshak was about to be restored to life. She was arrested, and a resident confessed to helping cremate the body. After Ogden's arrest, people scattered rather quickly, disillusioned. The home of truth now sits desolate, gray, and empty, with no trespassing signs everywhere, and not a soul in sight. Would you be brave enough to visit the home of truth? Tell us in the comments, and hit subscribe while you're at it. 5. St. Jean Vianney On May 4, 1971, disaster struck the tiny village of St. Jean Vianney, located in the south-central Quebec province in Canada. A period of heavy rain mixed with leader clay, which the town was built upon, liquefied under the stress, causing part of the village to drop down 98 feet 30 meters. This created a deep channel through which a river ran through and swallowed as many as 40 houses in its path. Francois Richard, a resident of saint jean Vianney, told a reporter he was in his living room watching the hockey game when he heard shouting outside. He walked down the street and saw houses falling one by one. One lucky woman survived by crawling onto the roof of her car after it had fallen into the crater, but many families found themselves trapped in the liquid mud, which then solidified. The landslide came and went within five minutes and killed 31 people in that short amount of time. One story claimed the gouge left by the landslide was 705 feet, 215 meters wide, and 0.3 miles, 0.5 kilometers long. As one would expect, the remaining residents of the village abandoned their homes, as it was declared the village was unsafe for habitation. Many people went to the next city over, Arvida. Today, Arvida and the landslide site are now within the municipal boundaries of Saguenay. It was later concluded that the village had been built on unstable clay soil 500 years earlier, long before settlement in the area came along. Today, the village hardly exists. A few empty streets and the steps of the old church square are all that's left. A museum exhibit commemorating the event sits at Saguenay's Place de Presbytère. 4. River Country River Country, located in Disney World, was the location's first water park. It opened in 1976, intending to make Disney World the vacation kingdom of America. The park offered a plethora of water activities, such as fishing, canoeing, sailing, and boat cruises. It also had many water slides and pools. River Country had everything to offer to all ages and was quite popular for nearly two decades. Disney World started to add significantly larger attractions in the 80s, and they all had more to offer than River Country, and guests decided to spend their time elsewhere while at the park. In the fall of 2001, River Country closed for the season, intending to reopen in the spring. Unfortunately, because of low demand though, this never happened. Disney reported that total abandonment was never the idea, but as years passed, that's exactly what happened. By 2005, there was an official announcement that River Country would never open again. Rumors started to circulate about the real reasoning behind the park's closing. There were whispers that it was not closed due to unpopularity, but because there was a dangerous amoeba in the Bay Lake water where the park was located. There were also several deaths that took place at River Country. One death was from the amoeba in the water, and two were from drowning in the Bay Cove. Because the water was filtered from Bay Lake, it wasn't clear like normal pool water. The boys that drowned went undetected for several minutes because of this. Today, almost everything is overgrown by nature. Slides are covered in moss, vines and weeds took over cafes, and a very intriguing top hot sits by its lonesome on a bridge. The creepiest part about all of this is the park still plays music, but it remains vacant. 3. Bozludza Monument at the peak of the Soviet's influence, a monument was erected to commemorate socialist communism in central Bulgaria. It lasted from 1981 to 1990, and it was abandoned along with the ideology that it was inspired by. Construction began in 1974 and was taken over by the Bulgarian army that had a team of artisans who were left with the task of providing large statues and murals. Images portraying Lenin and Marx were hung over the arena for the purpose of being displayed at a state functions and celebrations. Above it all, there was a red star-shaped window in honor of Soviet Russia. After the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989, the site was eventually abandoned, which resulted in vandalism. Most of the artwork has been destroyed, stolen, or removed, yet the concrete structure itself still stands strong. A preservation team has been working hard to get the monument listed as one of the seven most endangered heritage sites in Europe. The main entrance has been sealed, and is closed to the public. 2. Centralia 
Centralia, Pennsylvania once boasted 2,500 residents and 14 active coal mines in the early 20th century. But by the 1960s, its boomtown heyday had come and gone, and most of its mines were abandoned. Still, over 1,000 people lived here, and Centralia was far from dying. That is, until a coal mine fire began below. In 1962, a fire started in a landfill that spread to the maze of coal tunnels that miners dug thousands of feet below the surface. The fire eventually reached the coal seam. Residents assumed it would quickly die down, but shockingly, it's still burning to this day. In May 1962, the town council gathered to discuss the town's new landfill. At the beginning of that year, Centralia had built a 50-foot, 15-meter deep pit that covered an area about the half the size of a football field to deal with the illegal dumping that was becoming a problem for the town. However, the landfill was getting full and needed clearing before the annual Memorial Day celebration. It seemed to go off without a hitch, with the fire department present lining the area with incombustible material. When the fire turned to embers, it was doused with water. However, two days later, residents again saw flames. A week later, Centralia firefighters were baffled as to where the recurring fire was coming from. They used bulldozers and tools to stir up the remains of the burned garbage and locate the concealed flames. Finally, they discovered the cause. Turns out, at the bottom of the trash pit next to the north wall was a 15 feet, 4.5 meter wide and several foot wide deep hole. Unfortunately, it hadn't been filled with fire retardant material and trash had filled the gap. As the days passed, residents started to notice the ground was releasing smoke and foul odors were filling their homes. The town council decided to bring in a mine inspector to check the smoke, who determined that the levels of carbon monoxide in them were indeed indicative of a mine fire. They sent a letter stating that a fire of unknown origin was burning under their town to the Lehigh Valley Coal Company, LVCC. The council, the LVCC, and the Susquehanna Coal Company, which owned the coal mine, met to discuss ending the fire as quickly and cost-effectively as possible. But before they could come to a decision, sensors detected lethal levels of carbon monoxide seeping from the mine. All Centralia area mines were immediately shut down. Several attempts were made to stop the fire, but all were unsuccessful. Some residents stayed, but most moved on with their lives elsewhere. The ones that stayed found a silver lining when they discovered they could grow tomatoes midwinter and shoveling was a thing of the past. From then on, it was a constant battle between residents and the state, and in 2013, the remaining 10 residents won a large settlement and were granted $349,500 each and complete ownership of their property until they die. Once Centralia's population hits zero, the land will be seized and any remaining structures will be destroyed. One. Chernobyl. The Chernobyl disaster was a massive nuclear accident which happened on April 26, 1986. It's considered the worst nuclear disaster in history in both cost and casualties. A sudden surge of power during a reaction systems test destroyed Unit 4 of the nuclear power station at Chernobyl, Ukraine. The accident resulted in massive amounts of radioactive material flooding into the environment. Sand and boron was used by emergency responders to pour on the reactor debris. The sand was to stop the fires, and the boron was supposed to stop additional nuclear reactions. About a square mile of pine forest near the plant was cut down and buried to reduce radioactive contamination. Eventually, Chernobyl's remaining reactors were shut down for good. After the accident, the Soviet government evacuated around 115,000 residents who were in heavily contaminated areas, and later came back for 220,000 who were living in areas that were moderately affected. Chernobyl and the nearby town Pripyat are now known as the Exclusion Zone, where radioactive contamination is the highest and habitation was restricted. These days, the Exclusion Zone's been taken over by weeds, trees, and anything else nature has to offer. Around 1,200 of the evacuees tried returning to the Exclusion Zone a few months after the accident. Not caring much about safety or the legality of the situation, they chose to come back because of their love for the land. 100 residents still live there. After they pass away, no one's allowed to live in the exclusion zone because of the high levels of radiation that still exist, almost four decades later. Thanks for watching. Which of these apocalyptic places creeps you out the most? Tell us in the comments below and don't forget to subscribe. See you next time. Bye.